So as I mentioned, we are starting in the book of Genesis to walk through this. We're not going to read every verse. We won't go through every chapter, but we'll hit some highlights because we're going to see this is where the foundation of our faith, the origins of humanity are unveiled. And we're going to see, the, we're going to see creation, the fall, then people falling again. But we're going to see over and over God's promises, God's mercy, the promises that he had for his people then and the promises that he has for us today. So throughout this, we're going to see some enduring lessons of obedience, redemption, unwavering grace that shape our spiritual heritage. So if you would, you would think I'm going to tell you to go to Genesis, but I'm not. I'm actually going to read in Romans chapter 1 in the New Testament. I want to read this, read this verse. Romans 1.20 says this. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, and we're going to look at it in a few minutes, but through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. So what we're seeing in this verse, as you've heard people say it, you've probably said it like, before I came to Christ, I just felt something was missing. Maybe I had it all. Casey said he had it all, right? He said he had all these different things. He had a house, had an apartment, he had multiple cars, and it all came crashing down. Why? Because there was still something really missing. And we can have something missing in our life. And so that's why this verse becomes so important because then it's saying there's no excuse for anybody. They can see creation. They can see creation, whether they're in this auditorium, whether they've never been in church, or whether those of you that are watching online, we have no excuse. And I do want to say uh, just a couple shout outs for those online. I want to welcome Bobby from Gilbert, Arizona. Thanks for joining us. Felicia from Taos, New Mexico, and Kelly from Georgetown, Texas. Thank you specifically for joining us. We appreciate you being here. As we look at that, and I'm going to stay in the New Testament and read this verse from Hebrews chapter 11. It says, by faith we understand that this entire universe was formed at God's command. So at God's command, the entire universe, universe being, being formed, think about that. Like everything at God's word. They can clearly see invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature. So I'm going to go back because I read the wrong verse, so I'm going to read it again. Did, we did not come from... It, God's command that did not come from anything that we can see. So basically, we didn't have to see it. God wasn't even seeing it in the physical. And he's creating it out of nothing. Basically, from God's word. God created it all, the complexity of it. Jump down to verse 6. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to know him must believe that God exists must believe that God exists and he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Now, this is important because if you remember back to school, especially maybe some college classes, some Greek mythology, just some history, going jumping on the History Channel, the Discovery Channel, you see that some of these other gods, these so-called gods, why did they create humans? Well, they created humans, the mythology goes, to do menial tasks that they didn't want to do or to mess with or to have fun with or to play with. Not to have a relationship with, not to what this verse just says, to reward those who diligently were seeking them. That's not why they created human beings. So that's one of the ways we know this is completely false. These religions are completely false. So we know that the Bible opens with the famous words, in the beginning. Now, why, why does that matter? In the beginning, before there was anything else, in the beginning. Well, actually, to look at that, I want to actually, before we get to Genesis, we're close, but before we get to Genesis, look at something in the book of Exodus. And in Exodus, we're going to see, remember, at this point, Moses, he has grown up, even though he was born to a slave, he got to grow up in the palace for 40 years. He kills an Egyptian, he has to run away. Then he's in the desert for how long? Another 40 years. Hanging out with sheep all the time. And then he gets the opportunity to actually hear from God from a burning bush, right? This bush that is burning, he hears God. And what does God say to him? You're going to go tell my people, let's go. 
You're going to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. You're going to tell my people to follow you. And Moses said to God in Exodus 3.13, If I come up to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, what is his name? Okay, this is talking about God. What is his name? And who shall I say to them? God said to Moses, this is what you're going to tell them. Here's the answer. Here's the response. I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent you to me. So I am, this is important because in English it's going to translate, that Hebrew word is going to translate to be. By God saying this, he is affirming right then, right now to Moses and then to his people and also to Pharaoh that he is the personal, eternal, self-existent, self-sufficient creator and sustainer of all. Verse 15, God also said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. Thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So he's responsible for everything that exists. And this is what we understand. When we look at the book of Genesis and we look at the creation story, the first thing I want us to understand is though the world can be ever-changing, God is. That's it. God is. He tells Moses, you're going to tell them, I am. I am, I am who I am. This is who I am. God is. Now you think, okay, well, what does that mean? But it's important for us to realize and understand this because God owes his existence to no one. To no one. God didn't just get created and then he created the world. God owes his existence to no one. He is the only, the divine, eternal, supreme being. And he stands above all else. Above all else. Amen. So how, think about this. When we understand this and we say, okay, if that's who God is, then how should that, what does that matter? And how should it impact my life today? If he alone is eternal, if he alone is sovereign, if he alone is working his will, how do our lives and how do our plans play into that or relate to that? Think about that as we go through this series. And now we can go ahead and get to Genesis 1. To understand, number one, God is. Number two, God created. Let's look. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God existed, lacked nothing of himself. That was it. God existed and he's going to create. The Hebrew word for create is bara and it's meaning to create something new. And it's only used in reference to God because he's the only one that's going to be able to create something out of nothing or something new. Verse 2, the earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters. And the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and that he separated light from darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. And the evening passed and the morning came, marking the first day. So then we see creation. Now we're going to begin to look at it. In the next couple of verses, we'll see his creation and what he created. Now think about it. I've been here in Albuquerque my entire life. So maybe every day I don't look over at the mountains and say, wow, those are majestic and amazing. They look pretty nice. I took a good picture of one Friday night at our home football game where our boys beat down Clayton really good. Yeah, so if you're from Clayton, we're so glad you're watching and we're also glad your team lost. So I took a great picture of the mountains at sunset. It looked amazing. We're at Bernalillo High School. That's where our home field is. The mountains look great. But most, you know, a lot of times I'm just taking it for granted. But what about, think about in your life, maybe you've done the same thing, but what happens when someone comes from out of town that hasn't been here before or been here in a while? They're like, wow, Albuquerque can look like this. Albuquerque can have mountains. Albuquerque can get cold. Like they just picture like this desert and tumbleweeds, right? So we can take for granted God's creation because there was a time that was not here. There was a time. But God created it for his glory, the same reason why he created you for his glory, but to have a relationship. See, there's a different step when he created you, and we're going to see that in a minute. He created you to have a relationship with you. So as we look at this, we're going to see on the first day, we'll kind of just go through these kind of quickly. On the first day, light. So there was light and darkness. On the second day, sky and waters. The waters are separated. The third day, land and seas. The waters were gathered and vegetation. On the fourth day, a greater light, a lesser light, and the stars. Now I want to read that verse in whole for a reason. 
God made two great lights, the larger one to govern the day, the smaller one to govern the night. He also made the stars. Now there's a reason why, as Moses writes this book, that he doesn't say God created the sun and the moon. Because he knew there was a culture in that day that was worshiping the sun and the moon, worshiping the creation instead of the creator. So we see, you know, Moses is divinely inspired by God. He writes this book. Now we know there's been some edits since then some, to name some towns and some cities that were not named when Moses was alive. But as he's writing this, inspired by God, he realizes that we're not going to call it the sun and the moon because people worship that. No, we're just going to call it a, light, a lesser light, a greater light. Because in the end, it all points back to God. Those things aren't to be worshipped. On the fifth day, fish and birds to fill the water and sky. The sixth day, animals to fill the earth and then man and woman to care for the earth and to commune with God. And there's some specific things that God's given to man that challenged man. And if you missed Wednesday night service, Pastor Steve Jr. talked about that, what that dominion means for us today in a very practical way. If you missed that, I'd encourage you to go to our app. You can watch it, go online. You can watch those things completely free. But it was a message to help us understand and apply some of these verses some of these very verses to our lives today, right now. So I would encourage you to do that. And then on the seventh day, God declared all that he made to be very good. So when we look at that, we see, wow, look at what all God did. The psalmist says this in Psalm, one, in Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. So God created in a way to demonstrate his glory through the things he made. Verse 2, day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they made him known. Verse 3, they speak without a sound or word. That makes sense, right? Mountains aren't going to speak. The wind's not going to speak. But they can speak without a sound or a word, just like Romans told us. The creation is speaking, pointing everything back to a creator. Their voice is never heard, yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. Then it goes on to describe the sun, goes on to describe the radiance of the heavens to understand. And in God's creation, we see his nature. So number one, God is, and that's important. Number two, God's creation. God creates, and we see that now, and we can see his character. Number one, we see order. That one aspect of God's nature we see is as he brings his work and order out of complete chaos. Out of complete chaos. God took that was without form. That's what the Bible tells us. That was empty. And he brings creation. He brings substance. He brings order to it. So God brings order. It's important to remember that God is distinct from what he has made. But he's ultimately involved with his creation. See, I, I don't believe God just created it, everything and then said, okay, I'm out. He didn't do that. Now, in God's creation, all of us are unique. We all have things that we enjoy that are unique outside of work and some of the things we do. One of the things that I like to do is I like to, on some level, play competitive sports. Like, you know, even now, even though you know, I'm close to getting closer to 50 years old, um, to enjoy, man, Pastor Stevie's laughing. That's not, that's not very nice. Um, <laughs> so I like to play competitive sports. Well, for whatever reason, Pastor Joey, our youth pastor, was kind enough to put me on his forged basketball team. I have no idea why, other than he knew I would be competitive. And he knew that that guy from Rio Rancho, Pastor Brian, when I played against him, I was going to go at him. I wasn't going to let him bring his tall, like great, strong body into the lane and do whatever he wanted. I was going to push him. I was going to foul him if I needed to. I was going to get him out of the way, get some rebounds. So Joey knew that, that I was willing to do that. So I'll get in there and bang around, grab some rebounds, have some fun. But I'm not like overly skilled. I can't do like tricks and different things with a basketball. So I need someone that can help me out from the audience that can spin a basketball on their finger. Okay, you raised your hand quick. Thank you. Tell me your name as you come up. Daniel? Daniel? Well, that's perfect. <laughs> I didn't introduce myself to you guys earlier, but if I've not had the pleasure of meeting you, my name is also Daniel. And this is Daniel, and he's going to help me out. Are you on the baptism team? Um, I just got baptized. You just got baptized. Congratulations. That's awesome. 
See, that's what I'm talking about, life change. So go ahead, get it spinning. So here's what I believe. A lot of people believe God just created it, got everything going, and then he just walked away. You're doing great, Daniel, keep it up. You're doing wonderful. Look at that, he doesn't even have to touch it. Man, that is good work. Can you stay for third service? I'm just kidding. <laughs> so a lot of people think, a lot of, thank you so much, a lot of people think that God got this thing going. Got the earth going, got everything going, and they think, oh, well, where's God today? Bad things happen. And we're gonna see where all those bad things originated from in just a moment. As God's creation gave up some of their dominion to the enemy. But just like Daniel was up here spinning the ball, doing a great job making it look easy, God is right there intimately involved with his creation. He didn't turn his back to us, he didn't walk away. Even when we see when we sin, he didn't walk away and say, I'm gonna start over somewhere else. No, he was so invested with us and his creation that he would send his son to die for us, right? He didn't just give up on us. He didn't start something and then walk away. So we can see God creates in his nature, God creates, and that nature and that character shows us that he brings order. The second thing is he has power. We can see God's, in his creative acts, we see his divine power on display. God spoke and creation was. He didn't have to labor or toil. Maybe many of you are off tomorrow for Labor Day. Be safe. You know, be, have a great day. And we're selling, you know, we look back and we sell, you know, we work hard, so let's take a day off. God didn't take the seventh day off because it was so hard on him. He didn't, ta it wasn't so taxing on him. He took it off as a model for us to say, we're going to honor the Lord on this day. So he had power. He had power, for power, and by that same word that he brought creation, that's how he holds all things together. So number one, we see order. Number two, power. And then number three, holiness. We see in his creation, holiness and goodness through the creation of light and darkness. And then that picture throughout the Bible, an example to us, the light and the darkness and how we need to live. 1 John 1.5 says this. Now this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. The world, the world isn't just some happenstance, didn't happen by a blind chance or a probability. No, God created it. And that's what the Bible tells us. That's what we see in Genesis 1, God's creation. But we also see his desire to have a relationship with Adam and Eve, his creation, his highest form of creation, his people, which means he desires to have a relationship with you. Think about this. Think about it for a moment. How do God's power, how do his intimate involvement with creation and his goodness motivate you to glorify this awesome creator? When we look and we see who God is and what he's done, how does that motivate you? It should motivate us to live in submission and obedience to him, to completely obey him. If we look now at Genesis 2, as we continue to go through this, we're going to see all that God's doing as he moves. It says in Genesis 2, we're going to jump down to verse 15. And it's going to say the Lord God. Now that word Lord there, I'm going to emphasize that because we're going to read it several times in this passage. But that word Lord, it means he's trying to say, I want a relationship with you. You're not saying he's just the guy upstairs, the big guy upstairs, not just some random God. He's going to say, no, I'm Yahweh. Here's the relationship I'm trying to have with you. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat of the tree of every tree in the garden except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you're going to be sure to die. So the Lord commanded and he expected, just like he does today, obedience. He commanded and expected obedience. Adam was given freedom. Adam was given freedom. He could basically, he had lots of things to enjoy, lots of opportunities. But God said, there's this one thing, this one area I'm asking you not to go over there. Don't eat from that tree. 
Now, we think when God gives us lanes to be in, that he's holding us back. Well, that's not the case. We know that by God doing this, there's freedom by staying in the bounds, in bounds. Now, maybe some of you enjoy college football as it got really started yesterday. And we saw some teams, you know, just like blow out some people. And in the meaning of doing so, they played within the rules. Because what happens if they don't play within the rules? There's penalty flags. An offensive player can't keep running with the ball once he's gone out of bounds. The play is over. An offensive player can't go out of bounds and come back in bounds and catch the ball for a touchdown. Now, I don't know if you guys saw, but Ohio State tried that yesterday. <laughs> they were cheating. And for my wife's sake, and for Pastor Marty in Chicago, I hope you hear me, that they tried to cheat, but they got what? They got a yellow flag, and that touchdown didn't count. Now, what happens on the defense? If they hit somebody outside, they've already gone out of bounds, the offensive player's out of bounds. If a defensive player hits them, he gets a penalty. Why? Because we play in bounds, within the rules. Now, for a sports fan, you know, you can cheer against the other team. You can cheer against the refs when they're making calls you don't like. But it's more fun to watch when we understand the rules. Have you ever watched a game with someone that doesn't understand the rules? They're like, I don't understand what's happening. And you're trying to explain it. If it's a team you like, it's frustrating trying to explain while you're trying to watch your team. But it's more fun and enjoyable to watch the game when you understand the rules. Our lives are better and more enjoyable when we stay within the rules. Verse... 18, then the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. Verse 20, he gave names to all livestock, the birds of the sky, wild animals, but there was still no helper just right for him. There wasn't someone to be a counterpart. There wasn't someone to be on his team. Not a servant to him, but someone to come alongside him. Verse 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. Well, the man slept. The Lord God called out. Remember, I'm saying that for a reason. The Lord God called and took, took one of the man's ribs and closed up everything. All right, so he was taken. The rib was taken from his side. It wasn't taken from under his feet, so... He would trample on her or from his head so she could be over him, but from his side, from his, under his arm to be protected by him. Verse 22, then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and brought her to the man. At last the man exclaimed, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she has been taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united in one. So purpose here, not for their originality to be taken from them, but for them to become one flesh, united as one. They could still retain their uniqueness, but they would be united as one. Now this verse also tells us and helps us understand the biblical principle that marriage is between a man and a woman. One man and one woman. Now, people can get upset and they can say lots of things. When we say this, and they say, oh man, you're getting into a political issue here. Well, not really. We're not getting into a political issue. We're getting into a biblical issue. Long before the world could label this as political, it was biblical. It's biblical. Marriage is between one man and one woman. And this is what's happening today. People are attacking this very, the very first part of scripture. A man being a man, a woman being a woman. A man and a woman being married this is what's being attacked today. And it's not, I'm telling you, it's not political. It's biblical. So people can say whatever they want to you, but understand it's not political, it's biblical. It's, let's uh, look at the next verse. Now the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. They felt no shame. And in Genesis 3, verse 1, it says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God? So the, Satan's coming and he says what? Did God. What does he leave off immediately? He leaves off Lord. Why? Because he's attacking that relationship. 
And that's what he's going to do in your life. He'll attack that relationship. Because now if we can get him just to be some religious being, some big guy up in the sky that doesn't really care about me, our decisions can be different when that relationship's attacked. Did God really say you must not eat from any of the trees of the garden? Is that what God said? No, it's not what God said. So now he's questioning God's word here. God didn't say you can't eat from any of the trees. There was just one you couldn't eat from. But the enemy's coming in and he's questioning God's word just like he did to Jesus. In Matthew 4, when we see Jesus being tempted, the enemy came in and he attacked God's word. He attacked the scriptures. That's why Pastor Steve's always telling you, read, you've got to read. You've got to read this for yourself. You've got to get this in you. Even if you just get a scripture a day and meditate on it, a scripture for the week, a chapter a week, whatever it is, to get into God's word and to meditate on it and get it to be part of you. Because the enemy is going to come in. He's going to attack your relationship with God. And he's going to attack God's word. Do you know God's word? Are you able to say, well, or get in there and go find it. Go find it and figure it out. See what God's word actually says. Verse 2, of course we may eat from the trees of the garden, the woman replied. It's only from the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. Now, did God say that? Now, we could say that's a good idea because if you're not going to touch it, you're not going to eat from it. But God didn't say that. And religions do this today, put a whole bunch of add-ons and a whole bunch of rules to the relationship God wants to have with you. God never said, you can't touch it. She literally makes this up. If you do, you will die. Well, she's partially true. God was very specific when we read it in Genesis 2. You will surely die. So she's lessening the punishment a bit. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. He just flat out lies, and Satan still does that today. His tricks aren't different. They're the same. They were in the garden day one. They're the same today. He's lying. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. She's literally being told that God's holding out on her, and she believes it. The woman was convinced. She saw the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. That's temptation. It looks good. It looks delicious. That's why it's temptation. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. Eve literally had forgotten all God had given her to focus on the one thing she just began to think about she couldn't have. That's what her focus became on. All that God had, God had so much for her, she forgets all that. She took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her. He ate it. She looked, she took it, she ate it, she gave. At that moment, their eyes were open. They got what they wanted, but by disobeying God, now their eyes are open and they're in shock. And they suddenly felt shame. Remember, chapter two ended with they had no shame. Now they suddenly feel shame. The results are disastrous. They thought they were getting freedom, but true freedom was being obedient to God. They felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. What's that going to do? How long is that going to last? Fig leaves, if we understand the fig leaves at this time, they're itchy. Yeah, it's not going to be comfortable. Those are not the kind of underwear you wanted to wear. They were going to be struggling. Verse 8. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking in the garden. So they hid. So they tried to cover themselves and they hide. They hid among the trees. Again, this is hilarious. They thought God couldn't find them. Do we do the same thing? Try and cover it up and hide. The Lord God called the man. Where are you? Verse 10. He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked, the Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman <laughs> you gave me. So Adam doesn't just blame his wife, he blames God. So look at this, he tries to cover it up. He tries to hide, then he's living in shame, and now he's playing the blame game. Not just blaming other people, he is blaming other people, but he's also blaming God. Do we do those same things? Verse 13, then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. 
excusing our sin by blaming someone else or our circumstances, that's not going to work. It's not, it didn't work then and it won't work for us now with God. It doesn't work. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, and you can read the following verses there. He pronounces a curse, verse 16. Then he said to the woman, I'll sharpen the pain of your pregnancy and your pain you'll give birth and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. That sounds like what we see in lives today. Your desire will be to control your husband. He will rule over you. Verse 17, the man said, since you listened to your wife and you ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life, you're going to struggle to scratch a living from it. And then he goes on to explain the rest of that curse and how man's going to live. When we look at this account in Genesis, we need to see, okay, God is. God is. That's it. He created. He was not created. Now, we don't understand that right now, but we don't need to. We understand that God is. He's all-powerful. But then God creates. And why does God create? For his creation to glorify him and for us to have a relationship with him. That's what he desires, to have a relationship with you. And if you look in the, if you have our app, and our app's completely free, so you definitely should just download it. It's really simple. App Store, your Google Play Store, go in there and download it. But in the notes section there, I give you seven things that we need to know about temptation. I don't have time to go through those now, but just know this. We understand that in temptation, yeah, but it's going to look good or else it wouldn't be temptation. We understand the enemy's going to attack your relationship with God. He's going to attack God's word. You will be tempted in the end. You're going to be tempted. It's going to happen. Now, you also know that just because you're tempted doesn't mean you're in sin. We will all be tempted. 2 Timothy 2 tells us to run, to flee from it. We need to flee or to reject temptation. And I want to read this real quickly from James chapter 1, verse 12. It says, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterwards, they're going to receive a crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So there are a few different crowns in the Bible that as we obey God, in our, as we have a relationship with him, as we obey him, he gives us crowns. Now, we don't wear those crowns to strut around for ourselves. But when eternity comes, we're going to be taking those crowns off, kneeling at his feet, worshiping him. That's the point. But how do we get there? How do we get to that place of eternity where we can worship him, where we can take our crowns and lay them down at his feet and worship him? We have to have a relationship with him. We have to have a relationship. That's why he sent Jesus to die for us so that we can have a relationship with him directly. That's it. Also there in the notes, you'll see that I give you things, what to do when you blow it, what to do when we sin, because we're all going to blow it, we're all going to sin. But it's all pointing back to we need to make a decision that we're going to submit to God, that we're going to obey him, that we're going to live for him. When we do blow it, man, we're going to ask for forgiveness, and we're going to keep going, and we're going to keep moving on. We're not going to live in that, because shame can be, shame can destroy people. Shame will destroy you if you live in that, if you stay in that. But you can come to him for forgiveness. But you have to make that decision on your own. Just like Adam and Eve, they had a choice how they were going to respond to God. Each one on their own. Now they could blame each other, but they were each going to be held accountable to God on their own for their own actions, and that's what's going to happen to us. We will each be held accountable. So what do we do with Jesus? What do we do? Do we say, Lord, I, I need you. I need a relationship with you. You created me to have a relationship with you. The way I can have a relationship with you is by confessing Jesus, making him my Savior, and making him my Lord. That yes, I have a relationship with him, but I'm going to do what he says. I'm going to be obedient to him. Each one of us have that choice. Think about that as we pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, for those in this room, those watching online, Lord, I thank you. And just pray, Lord, that lives would be impacted and changed. Lord, we thank you, first of all, that, that you are. That you are. There's no one greater, no one before you. You are. And you created. And Lord, you created us so that we could have a relationship with you. That's what you desire. You desire a relationship with us. We can have that relationship by confessing Jesus as our Lord and Savior and by living for you. Knowing you and knowing your ways. 
living in that obedience. And when we blow it, we ask for forgiveness. But Father, I pray for those that have never confessed Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I pray they would do so now. They would do so this morning. Father, I pray for those that, for whatever reason, they're not living for you the way they should. Maybe they've allowed temptation to come in. They've allowed sin to come in. Or they've got shame now. But Lord, you, wanna, you want to forgive them. You want to remove that shame. You want a relationship with them. You don't want them to be hiding. You don't want them to be trying to cover things up. You want a relationship with them. We thank you for that now in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed, please, and your eyes closed. Each one of us have to make that individual personal decision because we're each going to be individually held accountable. If you've never confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we're going to give you the opportunity to do so in just a moment. Or maybe you have, but you're not living from the way you should. Here's your opportunity to say, yes, Lord, I need Jesus. I want Jesus to be my Savior, my Lord. This is your opportunity to come back to him. In a moment, we're going to all pray. Everyone here in the auditorium, we're all going to all pray together. But if you know you need to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'd like to know who we're praying with. If you'd simply just begin to start raising your hand and say, yep, that's me. I need Jesus. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, young man. Thank you. Thank you. If you say thank you, thank you very much. His hands continue to go up. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. You want to confess Jesus, thank you. Confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Have that shame removed. Thank you. Anyone else in the upper section as we get ready to pray? This is your opportunity. Thank you. And then anyone else on the lower section, and then we're going to pray. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Thank you. If you raise your hand or you're continuing to raise your hand, is what I'm going to ask. We're going to say a prayer, and everyone in the room is going to say it with you to support you. But if you're saying this and you're confessing Jesus as your Lord and Savior, whether it's for the first time or to come back to him, I'm going to ask you, don't just repeat words to repeat them. Don't just say something I'm saying. Make it your own prayer as well. Let's pray. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son to die for me. I confess I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I confess that Jesus is my Lord. And I believe on the third day he was raised from the dead. Help me to live for you and serve you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.